G'day guys, Chris Dory here. Today I'm going to go through my top 75 AFL Draft Power Rankings for Season 2021. So, let's get started. So before I start, just for a bit of background, so these are really my own rankings based on where I believe over the course of their career really they'd be rated if we're to look back in hindsight. So there's no correlation here between where they're going to go on draft day. It's just really a case of this is who I believe will be the best player. So I've sorted them into tier lists. So I've got these to pretty much separate the tiers. And I've also got a key here. So basically, if they're in black, they're coming out of the under 18s. If it's colored purple, we've got mature ages and over ages. So of which there's 21 out of the 75. The blue, we've got six out of the 75, so they're the delisted free agents. And then in italics, these are players who are already on AFL lists. But they're also players that I thought, look, just as points of interest, I would also include here just to show where they would fit if they were part of the national draft this year. So um, to get us started, so in the top tier, we've got Jason Horn Francis and Nick Dacos. So for me, pretty straightforward. Both of these guys can be top 10 mids in the competition, and they've also got forward of center scope. So why Horn Francis ahead of Dacos? For me, just a little more influential in terms of impact per possession, but also in terms of what he does defensively. Just that's really how he impacts games like really no other junior I've seen. But love them both. It's a 1A, 1B scenario. They're both going to be terrific. So that's why they're both part of the top tier. So going down the next tier, so we've got Sam Darcy. So um, most recently he measured in at 205 centimeters and you're looking at a key forward. So, and he can play key defense, can play a little bit in the ruck, but I think he's most damaging as a key forward. So really until Jason Horn Francis's final final in the Sandfall at league level, really Darcy had for me what was the single best game of the year. So it was a six goal haul, just looked completely unstoppable as a forward. So. Um, and, and with really the rate of growth, rate of improvement, there's a lot there that suggests, although he's not necessarily the third best player today, he's someone where I believe in the future he will be. Because with those key position players, you're really looking at the best combination of, do they have that rate of improvement? Well, Darcy seems to still be growing and he's improving at an incredible rate. Coming into the year, he wasn't seen as an early pick. He was seen more as a possible late pick. So you've got that sort of rate of improvement. You've got incredible height. He takes his grabs, great at ground level, good skills. So he's got those points of difference as well. Production, look, that's still sort of an area of improvement. He can become a more consistent producer in the future, but I think that'll come as he develops a bit more as a footballer. So um, really a name to watch there for the future. And the dogs have got a great one, just as Collingwood do with Dacos. So next category down. So um, Finn Callahan, I've got top of that group. Maybe it's a bit of a risk having him there, honestly, but for me, I'm just looking at his 191 centimeters still growing, which is phenomenal, but just he's really shown the rate of improvement as well. So having those things, having the points of difference that he does, I've never seen a guy 190 centimeters or taller really move the way he does through the midfield. So special talent just needs to develop that contested side and that tackling to really be deserving of that number four spot. But if he does, well, maybe he could be moving up with this sort of group. So really exciting player there. And I think really he's probably, aside from these guys who'll get bid on, he's probably that next best, I guess you could say in terms of the live picks. Um, Josh Ward, so for me, he's really, I guess, of this category, the safest. Some might say he's probably the lower reward, potentially, but I think he'll be an exceptional footballer. So what he was doing in the last month in the NAB League, phenomenal. He was basically matching Nick Dacos for output just about. So you're looking at a really good midfielder right here. So look, you're not going to get the scoreboard impact or the forward of center craft of a Dacos, but in terms of what he does through the midfield, he's a complete player. So wins it, all class with how he uses it, moves well. There's nothing wrong with his game. He's a fundamentally incredible footballer. So um, he'll slot into a midfield next year. So um, yeah, I think he'll be a great pick and a good value get for that matter for whoever gets him. Um, and then we've got Neil Erasmus. So um, we'll have to see whether he's a top 10 pick, but what he was doing at the start of the year was very impressive. So 
Um, you've got that December birthday, so that's always fantastic. So, and he's also still growing as well, but he's also really developed as a contested ball winner this year. So, um, and how he reads the game, how he reads it in flight, just reads it early, intercept marks. You've got all these really unusual characteristics and he can go forward, he can kick a goal. So for me, there's a lot there. And as long as he sort of develops his kicking a little bit, I think he'll be a really good piece for a team. And I think really just based on that rate of improvement, that ball winning, I think he'll be run one of the really good midfielders. And I think there's a really good chance that he'll reach that potential. And then moving down, so we've got Matthew Johnson. So as with Erasmus, another WA midfielder, and Johnson could possibly go a touch earlier. And there's a bit of contrast there where Johnson, he isn't that same level contested ball winner that Erasmus has proven to be this year, but what he does have is the class. So he's that 192, maybe 193 mid, but he moves just incredibly well. So has the agility, has the speed. It's just that first step that's incredible. And in terms of that composure, the skills, he's got all those ingredients. So for him, it's just really all about, can he, as with really, you could say of a Callahan, can he develop that contested side? If he does, you're looking at a gun midfielder and he can be one of really this category sort of up here. So we're looking at a really exciting player, but just because he doesn't have that contested side, probably a little disappointing at the start of the year based on my expectations coming in. I couldn't quite justify putting him into this sort of range, but certainly what he was doing late between what he was doing during the under 19 champs, what he was doing as well in the um, waffle reserves finals, just incredible. So playing really good football, one of the informed players to finish the season. So um, very exciting at that height. So um, yeah. Um, next up, so Mac Andrew, so Melbourne Next Gen Academy, of course they won't be able to match bids with the new rules stating that if there's a bid in the top 20, you can't match. So um, unlucky there for Melbourne, so whoever gets him will be getting someone pretty talented to say the least. So you're looking at a 201 centimetre, really project ruck, but he's got a lot of talent. So high leaper, um, you've got the skills, moves with an incredible fluidity for someone that height, and he can take a grab as well. So it just has that reach and and can take a grab. So I'd love to see him start his career in defense. I think that's the best opportunity really to develop his game. But there's also the chance as well that he starts as that sort of, I guess, in a role a bit similar to a Luke Jackson, where you're playing a lot of forward, but getting some shots in the ruck. Though I think given, again, how light he is, I think it'll take a bit longer until we see an Andrew through the ruck. But um, in the long term, certainly, I think Ruck will be his best position just with how high he gets, where he'll jump at a Ruck contest and he'll get his hips above the opposition Ruckman quite often. So, um, but it's just a case of getting stronger so he doesn't really get knocked off the ball, can't sort of be body blocked so then he can't get a jump at the ball. That's really sort of the problem there. That's going to limit him in the short term, at least, from being that sort of Ruckman. But um, Lee Kalir, for me, he's the best key defender in this draft. Um, just firstly, the rate of improvement. So again, with the key position players, I love the rate of improvement because that's a sign that there's more improvement to come. And even though he's a couple of years older, I'm not worried about that at all. We've had so many mature ages over the years that have really shown that they can continue improving and often even at higher rates than those that come out of the under 18s because they've got that sort of built up resilience. They know that they have to work that much harder to really ensure they have a career. So um, yeah, I'm definitely a big believer in Lee Kalir and he's got the attributes as well where he he broke the running vert record, of course, at the combine. And you've also obviously got those intercept marking components where he'll fly for it. He'll take the grab. He's good defensively as well. So he really sort of ticks the boxes. So, and for me, the number one objective, of course, as a key defender is you really want that high level interceptor because you look at all the best key defenders in the comp, they're all doing that at an elite level. So Lee Kalir, he could be possibly something like our all Australian Alir Alir this year. So very exciting player. Really like him. And I think he'll be, as per my recent video, I think he'll be one of the real value picks in this year's draft. So Josh Rochelle. So I think on draft day, he goes earlier than this. He could be a top, could be say five, six, seven sort of picks. I think he'll be going pretty early. So, um, and look, in terms of that sort of combo forward mid, I think he's really good. And he's been spoken mostly about as a forward, but I actually really rate what he does through the midfield. Whereas a genuine first possession winner, of course, in terms of skills, I could make a case that he's the most skilled in the draft, just in terms of particularly what he does by foot. He's really exceptional, and he's, of course, a threat forward of center. Um, why I don't necessarily have him as high as he might go on draft day is simply a case of having seen him a couple of years ago, what he was doing in the NAB League. Look, he was already really advanced there, so 
compared to a lot of the others, he really hasn't shown that same rate of improvement. And being that, I guess, shorter type, does he necessarily have the same upside? Not sure there. And he can also have his inconsistent games where he can be a little bit quiet. So has his games where he tears it apart, dominates, can be best of field, but other games where he can be a bit inconsistent, a bit quiet. So um, I have sort of kept that in mind. But of course, dual position impact, huge value there. So I wanted to give him that acknowledgement by putting him at number 10 on my board. Number 11, Angus Sheldrick. So again, one he won't go this early on draft day, but I really love him. Just the ultimate competitor in this year's draft, big bodied, strong midfielder, but has the burst of speed as well. So he can win it on the burst, he can receive on the burst as well. But seeing what he did firstly against Jason Horn Francis, one of the best games of footy I've seen really among sort of the under 18, under 19 ranks this year. So um, just really sort of relegating Horn Francis in the end to being a forward in that matchup. So phenomenal stuff doing that. Um, what he was doing in the um, Waffle Colts finals as well, sensational. But during the under 19 champs, he was the leading contested ball winner of the time. Really that dominant midfielder that really just didn't give the South Australian midfield a chance. So um, yeah, I think Sheldrick's absolutely exceptional and I think he'll be a really high value pick in this draft. He could be something like the Lockie Neal of this draft. So um, certainly a name to keep an eye out for. So number 12, Zach Taylor. So for me, one of the most complete midfielders in the draft, um, has the speed, has the agility, great skills. So you've got all that, but he'll rack it up. Um, you've got the contested ball winning as well. So really good midfielder. Um, really happy to have him at 12. And here's another where again, I don't think he'll necessarily be featuring this high on draft day. I think he's probably more a second rounder as I'd say from a league And with a Sheldrick, he could be a second, maybe even third round, depending on um, where some of the midfielders go and really how many, I suppose, midfielders go early. So um, yeah, I do see certainly quite a bit of value there with a um, Taylor. Um, but number 13, so I've got Ben Hobbs. So really solid midfielder, just one of those guys where he just goes in, wins his own footy, brings it defensively. So he brings all that effort. So, um, but what's he missing? Well, he's not that sort of athlete, skills, not great, probably lacking those other tricks. So um, probably needs to develop that outside game. So look, he's not the perfect midfielder, but he's one of those, I guess you could say year one ready guys. So um, we'll have to see sort of how he develops. He's one of those really, I guess you could say, he's got that high floor, but then he's probably got that relatively speaking lower ceiling where he just doesn't have as many tricks as a few others have. So um, that's why I've probably got him a little bit lower than he'll feature on draft day because he's going to be a top 10 pick ultimately. So um, just a personal preference thing there. Um, so number 14, Nasaya Wanganin Malira. So in terms of outside players in this draft, he's just really, I guess, in terms of that pure outside talent, really as good as they come. So he's got that agility, that speed. He just runs around guys just so easily and just avoids tackles with ease, creates that time and space for himself when under pressure. And of course, he's got the skills with it. So um, incredibly talented, but if he was to be higher on my board, I'd really be expecting him to be able to win a bit more of his own ball than he can. So still quite skinny at this stage. Hopefully he develops that contested side. And if ever he does, well, yeah, you're looking at a really good player that could really be quite a lot better than this. So, and again, a bit like a Hobbs, maybe we're looking at a top 10 picks. So I think he probably goes a little bit earlier than this on draft day, but that's just where I've got him positioned, at least on my own personal board. So number 15, so I've got Josh Gibkiss. So um, he's generally speaking, pretty widely regarded the best key defender in this draft. Um, but for me, look, I'm a Lee Kalia fan. Um, with the Gibkiss, I really liked what he was doing early in the season, just as that real, I guess, intercept marking force. When he's going for those intercept marks, that's when he's at his absolute best. Because he can leap, he can take a grab. So you've got those components there that are promising. But what I was finding is when he went forward, he just looked lost, so that didn't work for him. But he had other games in defense after that as well, where he was just playing really a shut down role. And look, he just wasn't intercepting enough at all, doesn't rebound at all. So um, yeah, I guess he just really needs to make sure if he's going to be playing a lockdown role, he just needs to have that intercepting balance. So, um, but certainly I think he's a solid get. And um, yeah, look, he should be a top 10 pick more likely than not, I'd be imagining this year, um, just given there aren't all that many, I guess, high-end key position players. But yeah, look, for me, I'd say he probably should be picked a little later in terms of, I guess, where I think his quality fits in comparison, at least to the others in other positions. So, but 
personal preference. And then we've got Jaya miss. So um, yeah, look, he could go a little earlier than this, depending on say if a Fremantle or another club really want to go a bit earlier on a key position or on a key forward more specifically. Um, and look, he is a 196, but he is that really sort of leading style forward. So um, we'll have to see sort of how that works, whether he can become that genuine key forward, but um, certainly his rate of improvement's been terrific. And if you're looking for someone who can just really hit the scoreboard and really just nail those opportunities in front of goal pretty consistently, look, um, a miss really doesn't miss too often in front of goal. Late season, look, he did during the under-19 champs when he appeared miss a few shots that really he should have converted and same later in the um, Waffle Colts campaign, but certainly for the vast majority of the season before he was sort of had a few niggles that sort of slowed him down and he was really terrific. So really making the most of those opportunities he got. So um, yeah, it looks like he can be a pretty solid get and that's why he's in this category. Um, Arlo Draper, look, he's had some injuries, but I've really liked the signs from him. So he's a skinny midfielder, but he can win at contested. So that's promising. In terms of that class composure, that's what he brings to the table. So um, very exciting player. Um, he's got versatility as well. So he can play midfield forward. You could even use him back if you wanted. Um, can play inside, outside. So there's options there. But look, possibly he's been best probably more inside mid, so hopefully he builds up that strength so that he can convert that to AFL level, and otherwise forward he's been pretty handy too, sort of across half forward as that sort of more so playmaker than finisher, so looking for those more inside 50 targets, I think that's where he can also provide a bit of value and may start his career potentially. Um, the next one's a personal favourite of mine, and We've got Italics here, so of course he's already been picked up, so pre-selected as a rookie, so and that's of course due to the AFL's concessions. So, um, so we've got Bodhi Yuland. So just in terms of that real power through the midfield, just breaks tackles with ease. So really strong body. I think actually his most recent measurements are 187 centimeters and 90 kilos. So really powerful lad. Um, but he can certainly build his endurance, but he's one of those guys where a bit like a Jake Stringer, a bit like a Jordan Degoe, he can just really impact games really heavily. So um, loved what he did in the NAB League games that I've seen and the one VFL game that I caught of him as well. Just really looks like a footballer and really an influential one when he's up and going. So really exciting. You can put him back as well across half back. He can generate drive, intercept a bit, and you can even put him forward of center if you wanted. But I just really love that sort of power through the midfield as that real point of difference. So um, it'll be, I'm really hopeful that Gold Coast can develop him. Fingers crossed they can start sort of improving their player development and start improving that. But um, yeah, if they don't necessarily develop him over the next few years, he'd be someone I'd really be targeting in a hurry in terms of as a trade target. Because I think there's really a lot of scope there to develop. So he's someone I'm really excited about and probably more so than I'd imagine too many others would be at this point in time. So number 19, Mitch Owens. So St Kilda Next Gen Academy. So um, they'll be hoping that there won't be a bit inside the top 20, but there is the chance that that could happen. So there's a few clubs sort of later in that first round that are sniffing around and might have some interest. So starting with GWS with their second pick sort of at 13 or so. So um, that'll be one to watch out for. And there'll be a few clubs later on in the round that are looking for that more sort of taller outside type. So, um, and with an Owens, what's really appealing to me with him. So is that taller mid, but he's that late grower where he's just grown a heap in the last few years. Um, improved a lot with his footy as well. So again, I'm really seeing that upside with him. So that last month of the season really played a good brand of footy, but before that he wasn't really as much on the radar as someone who could feature high in the draft. So um, it'll be interesting with, I guess, that small sample of really good games later on in his season that um, where he'll go essentially. So he could be something like a 15 to 30 in terms of where he's drafted. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, and another taller midfielder here. So we've got Mitch Nevitt. So he's your 194 centimeter mid. So really tall, big bodied mid, really strong, stands up through tackles importantly, um, but tackles well, strong contested marking target, gets around the ground, really moves well. So he's got that athletic profile. Um, whether his skills are there, look, that could improve ground level craft as well. But um, yeah, look, there's a lot of tools there that make him a really exciting midfielder where he, is that almost and Owens might be a bit the same as well, but he could be a boom or bust where really he could be one of the best players in the midfield as a midfielder if this 
if he really works out and goes to a good program, develops well. So we'll just have to wait and see. But for me, as with an Owens, I think Nevitt's a really developable developable player. So that's why for me, he's in my top 20. So the next, next category down. So Matthew Roberts. So I said in my video last night that he's number 21 now on my draft board and all year I've had him as a top 10, but just watching him through the under 19 champs, look, he just didn't do enough ultimately. And how he closed the season out, look, he had moments, but he didn't do enough. He's one of those guys where he really wants to win a lot of it and really needs to win a lot of it to be an influential player. So, um, and look, he can at times be damaging with his kick, but he's just one of those guys where he just needs to show a bit more composure with the ball, lower his eyes a bit more, look for those short targets more. If he starts to develop that, look, maybe we're looking at a really good midfielder, but um, they're the things we need to see from him first. So he's a second to third rounder now. He won't be going first round on draft day. So I still probably have him quite a bit higher than where he's likely to go on draft day ultimately. But um, yeah, look, I'm still a fan, but I have had to sort of ease back a little bit in my projection there. And the reason he could drop so far, of course, is this is a really even draft. And that's something that's really important to understand where like you could have someone where I could rate them as a top 10 player. So you could be in this sort of seven, eight, nine, ten 10 range, and you could pretty easily with a few bad games really drop into the 20s. So, um, and that's ultimately what's happened with quite a few players where I might have rated them one month around the 10 mark, and then they're outside the top 20 the next, just because it really doesn't take a lot really to drop down that tier into that sort of next group. And alternatively for others to jump up a tier with some really strong performances and really prove that they're really that class above. So um, so I'm pretty comfortable with a Roberts at 21. Um, ultimately, he's an inside midfielder and what he was doing, certainly in the Sanford league level, being that forward outside mid, it just wasn't the best use case for him. So he really needs to play through the middle, just be that ball winner and really that, I guess, high production one at that. So that's how I think he's best used. Um, Jacob Van Royen, so um, capable key position player. What sold me on him later on in the year was actually what he did during the under-19 champs as a key defender. So um, look, he can play forward. I don't love him forward though. I think he's probably a bit limited, probably needs a few more tricks to be a really good key forward. But as a key defender, he just one-on-one, -on -one, he was holding his own. So that's great. He was intercepting, can rebound a little bit. So um, yeah, I think there's real scope to develop in defense. And look, although is that sort of, he's not a super tall sort of key position player, is that 193, 194 type. So, well, he could be a 195 with another centimeter or two growth. But um, yeah, look, I, I think that's still more than sufficient to be a capable key defender. If you've got the game, which he does, his athletic is strong. I think he'll translate fairly well. So I think there's a good chance that he develops. But yeah, for me, it's more key defender than key forward. So that's the thing I'd be more conscious of. Um, Alistair Lord. So a lot of people I'm sure will find this quite high and having him ahead of Sin and Gota is one of my trademark moves. So, or trademark picks. So I, I just love what he does as a rebounder. So that he's got that run and dare like no one else really in this draft in terms of really how he takes on the game across halfback. And in addition to that, he's got the skills as well. So just as a pure rebounder, I think Lord is the best pure rebounder in this draft. So he's not as tall as a Sin or Goda. He might not necessarily have the scope to go through the midfield as a Sin or Goda may, although that would be speculative to suggest they will become more midfielders than sort of more your, I guess, rebounding halfbacks. But yeah, I just love what Lord does as a rebounder and not having as much exposure during the season. Look, he won't be as high on many draft boards as I've got him, but yeah, I just like his talent. So I'm really excited to see what he can do at the next level ultimately. So Josh Sin at 24. So th this is going to be much lower than he'll go on draft day. He could be a top 10 pick. So it could be top five even, depending on if a club really wants to go early on him. So, but what he does bring to the table is he's got that run and drive. So um, that's what he does best. That's how he impacts games. He's got a long kick as well that can be damaging at times, though it can occasionally be a bit hit or miss. So um, if he wanted to be higher on my board, look, I really wanted to see a contested side to his game, but I just didn't really get to see that from him. And also intercepting on a higher level as well, given he's a 
reasonable enough height across halfback. But yeah, didn't see sort of the midfield craft, just not sure he's got that. So I'm really just looking at him purely as that, I guess, rebounding halfback given the running weapons that I've seen from him and how he really takes on the game. Almost as that sort of 70, 80 meter type, I guess you could describe him as. So um, still a very exciting player, but I just don't necessarily rate him as highly as others would. And look, he has had his injuries, but he's got that early year birthday. So I really do expect him to be a lot more advanced than a lot of others. So that's also part of the reason why I have him a bit lower than others will. And Josh Goda. So he's another way he can be a top 10 pick potentially. So the WA clubs have expressed potential interest. So um, there'll be quite a few sort of in that sort of pretty high range that will be considering him. So I think he's a top... I'd be surprised if he drops outside the top 15, honestly. So um, I think he's going to go pretty early. But yeah, he's played his best footy across halfback ultimately. He's that taller type who can go through the midfield, moves really well through there. So you've got those components there. But look, he would still need to develop as a contested ball winner. And look, also his ball use could really sort of use some improvement as well, particularly by foot. So by hand is great, but... Um, yeah, his work by foot really does need to sort of step up as well. So, and look, if you're that sort of tall rebounding intercepting defender and look, your kicking is a bit suspect at times, look, that isn't ideal. So that's why I don't have him as high, but certainly he can run and take on the game and find a heap of it to say the least. So, um, I think he's still sort of a solid bet, but he's one where you're betting on the potential that he develops more so than he's certainly there now. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of my position more so there with Goda. Um, Connor McDonald. So he was playing really good footy early in the season, but of course we didn't get to see a lot of him, which was a shame there. But he's one of those guys where he covers a heap of ground, finds a heap of it. Um, possibly a lowish impact per possession, though he can hit the scoreboards. So um, he's someone where he can certainly play a really good variety of game. And second round onwards, I think, is sort of where he goes. Second or third round, I think, is probably his range. And um, yeah, we'll see how that works out. But yeah, it's just one of those where I'd love to have seen more of him. Had we seen more games, maybe I'd have him a bit higher. But ultimately, I found, although I rated him early, there were just a few others that I felt sort of developed a little bit past him in terms of, I guess, where I project their long-term potential being. So that's why I've got him a little bit lower. But he could be in that sort of Roberts category where, look, he's a good midfielder, um, but maybe doesn't have all the bells and whistles necessarily of some of the others that will probably go a bit earlier. Um, Josh Fahey, so he had that incredible game against um, the Geelong VFL game for the AFL Academy side, where he won best of field honours, I guess, just for the Academy side, not including the Geelong players who just completely dominated. But yeah, he was taking the kick-ins, really generating a lot of drive from defence, incredible kick, very penetrating. He's almost that Trent McKenzie type, good athlete as well. Um, doesn't have a contested side to the game, is really just that pure sort of, I guess, rebounding defender can negate a little bit, can intercept a bit. So um, yeah, certainly fits in this range. I could easily have him at 26 as well. And he'd really be, again, contending with the likes of Sin Goda. He's really in that same category as per with, I guess, fitting in this tier. So um, yeah, I think he'll attract a bid most likely in the second round. I can't imagine he'll last to the third round in terms of bidding. Um, he's just too talented in terms of that small sample that we've seen. He's also played a little bit of VFL as well. Um, Toby Conway. So the best pure ruck in this draft, ultimately, 205 centimetre. So you've got some scope there, but he's one of those really aggressive rucks. So he follows up well, wins his own ball, often wins it out of the ruck even. So he doesn't even need to tap it half the time, it feels like. So um, yeah, you've got a real competitor there. So he'll need to add a few more tricks, of course. Um, it'd be good if he can add that more forward of center scope, become a bit more of that sort of dominant marking target forward of center, um, maybe get a bit more involved, more in general play around the ground as well. But he's that real contested beast of a ruckman. So I think there's a really good chance that he becomes really good through there. So, and in terms of his impact in the NAB league, phenomenal impact, just really each game, just about, he was really the dominant ruckman afield and really one of the more influential players in really all the games I've seen him play this year. So, um, yeah, he's an exciting ruckman and certainly second round onwards, I think he's very much suitable to see selected. So K Dipmar, so he's another where I don't think he goes this high. He's more of a later pick more likely than not, but He's just that bigger bodied, strong midfielder, wins a high amount of it contested, has a good burst of speed, but he's just a really lively midfielder where he brings the energy, brings the pressure, tackles. 
So he just feels like he's buzzing around, making something happen and just really exerting his influence, a bit like a Sheldrick almost. So along with Sheldrick, I thought Dittmar was one of the real risers during the under-19 champs for WA and I'm, I'm really solid on his talent. I think he's a really good one. And next up, Ned Long. So um, is one where is 195 centimeters. So that's awesome. And he's playing through the midfield. So um, not too many guys at that height can do that, but Ned Long can. So, and look, small sample at the start of the year, but he was one where he was both winning it through the midfield and going forward and hitting the scoreboard at a good rate. So um, exciting player. Wish he played more games. Had I seen more of him, maybe I could justify having him a little bit higher. But I'd say probably, relatively speaking, low impact per possession. And I'd say the same of Connor McDonald, who's a little bit higher as well. So had I seen more impact per possession, I'd be more inclined to have both McDonald and Long, for that matter, a little bit higher. So, um, But yeah, certainly when you're that height and you're playing good footy, well, that's really exciting as a midfielder. So, um, And it'll be interesting to see if he can grow a few more centimetres. I think at the start of the year, he might have been listed at 192. So being 195... As per my hypothesis, I, I think we've got a chance that we might sooner or later get that 200 centimetre midfielder and Ned Long is another in that sort of progression towards that, I suppose, where he could be that, I guess, another sort of Crips height type. So it's quite exciting really having more of those guys joining the AFL as genuine midfielders. And then Hugh Greenwood. So of course he was going to enter the draft and he would have been a free for all. Um, but of course he's been signed by North Melbourne. But I just wanted to acknowledge him and say this is where, in terms of this order of players, I would be willing to spend for him. So of course, given he was a delisted free agent, we're looking at someone who, at least in my opinion, is still pretty good. So of course he's coming off that major injury. Look, he's turning 30 next year. So um, yeah, look, it's not like he's a young buck and that's why accordingly he was he's rated quite a bit lower on this board than perhaps his current play would suggest. But um, yeah, I think he's still got another possibly three years of still really good football. And as well with um, Cunnington being down as well, well, it's just really fortunate timing, honestly, for North Melbourne. So I think Greenwood's going to play a really significant role through that North Melbourne midfield. So um, I'm really excited for him to, I guess, have that opportunity and really be a good mentor for a lot of the younger developing midfielders for North Melbourne, because he'll certainly teach them that sort of I guess physical edge how to win the ball how to pressure and really bring it defensively as well so um, yeah I think he's one of the more underrated midfielders in the comp and really he's been one of Gold Coast's very best players for the years he's been there he's been a top five player on their list so um, my opinion of course but that's how highly I rate him um, and then moving on to some mature ages so and I spoke about again in my video last night all of these guys but with Bailey Rogers, so you're looking at really the Waffles best. So he won the medal for the best in the Waffle last year. And is that midfielder forward, wins it through the midfield, all class, can go forward, hit the scoreboard, take a mark. Um, he's played in defense in the past as well, been really good. So yeah, I think he's really just one of those lock and load, instant best 22 guys. So, and being those few years older, it doesn't matter. He's still in his early to mid twenties. So he's gonna have a long career ultimately. So I really like the value that he represents really anywhere from 30 onwards, I guess you could say. Um, and then Blake Slenslog. So former Geelong category B rookie. He's been one of my favorite players throughout the year. Loved what he did in the waffle first half of the year as that sort of intercepting defender. So just reads it so well, good ball user, moves well, strong, rapid improver as well. So ticks really the key boxes that I'm looking for in a key defender. And then Sam Skinner. So um, again, he was really one of the mature ages. I guess you could almost call him a former delisted free agent. As with Slenslog, it was in the 20, uh, sorry, 2020 off season. Both of them, for that matter, were delisted. And um, Skinner, I think, terrific get for Port Adelaide. So it was a delisted free agent for nothing. You're getting someone who I at least regard as a top 35 talent compared to the rest of this year's draft pool. And he's just that instant key defender. I think round one, we could even be looking at him. So had that um, final where he had his, um, I think it was 10 contested marks, probably had 11 intercept marks or something silly in that game. So when you've got that level of impact down back, that's terrific. So I think he pairs with um, Alir Alir in Port, Adela in Port Adelaide's defense and even further upgrades that part of the field. So um, really exciting stuff, but he's much better in defense than he was as a forward. As a forward, I didn't really rate him, but love the transformation he's made in defense in the latter half of the Sandful League season. 
So Angus Baker at 35. So he's had obviously the time in the NEFL where he was just absolutely dominant across half back. So just getting those 30 plus disposals, high level interceptor, high level rebounder. So you've got all that. So as you're a 191 or so, 192 centimetre defender, that's awesome stuff. So, and then this year, really terrific season in the VFL as well. So really showed that he really, really sort of belongs at that level. So I, I really think he'd be an instant AFL level. Just walk up start in a best 22 if you really you need that, I guess, general defender who can intercept a bit, rebound a bit. So yeah, he's one where really he should have been picked up years and years ago, but it's just AFL clubs keep ignoring him, which is really their loss at the end of the day. Because again, plug and play, genuine best 22 standard for me. So um, I, I think Essendon really missed out on that opportunity, both early season and mid-year. Though, in, in fairness to them, though, they've really developed a lot of their defenders. So um, yeah, hopefully someone else gives him a crack this year. Not sure they will necessarily, but he's certainly one where I would strongly advocate him, given I believe fully that he is a best 22 player for AFL purposes. And again, he's one of those where he's in that early to mid 20s so it's not like he's too old he's really that sort of medium to long-term player so you're gonna have a full proper career from him so he's not just a short-term fix by any stretch of the imagination and then you've got Jack Avery so what he was doing as an overager in the Waffle Colts terrific was the highest sort of possession winner the whole year at that level and um yeah doing that across half back so Later on, of course, he was playing at league level and really playing good footy as well. So held his own, showed even though he's more that intercepting type, he could even shut down a Tyler Keitel, who's the best key defender in the waffle at league level. So just held him to two goals, which is well under his average for the year. So um, really good stuff. So he can defend when he has to, which has been one of the critiques on him. Um, if he improves his work by foot and really becomes, I guess, a more reliable and consistent kick, Maybe he could be worth even a lot more than this. But, um, yeah, it was just a case of what he did during the under-19 champs. Look, I really wanted to see a bit more domination from an Avery than I did. But, yeah, look, he was still fine. But really, when you're an overager, you really need to dominate at that level, which is why having him earlier in the year in my top 20, I did have to move him back a little bit into this category. And, of course, it, it doesn't really take a lot, given the evenness, again, in this draft, to really move guys down or up accordingly. Um, so Charlie Dean at 37. So as I said in my video last night, really impressive resilience. Got overlooked a couple of years ago, but kept working. Had a really good VFL season this year, really transitioning as a, from a previously a key forward into a key defender. So um, really won the Rising Star equivalent in the VFLs, the Fothergill Round Mitchell Medal. So um, yeah, it looks like a piece for me at AFL level. And I think mid to late draft, I think he'll get picked up by a club. So um, yeah, I think he'll be a really good get. And after Lee Kalir, probably, and I guess you could say Blake Slensog as well, but he's probably that other key defender who really deserves a shot of those mature ages. So I think in terms of key defenders, it's really that mature age group that really represents quite a good amount of value this year, if that's what your team is after. So Ronald Fedjo Jr. So one of the most exciting outside players, if not the most exciting player in this draft, just in terms of what he can do with ball in hand. So he's got the speed, agility. He's got the skills as well. Just check out some highlights of him. He's phenomenal. So um, we'll need to develop that contested side to really show he can make it at AFL level. But if you've got a big ground that has some width to it, I think he can be a really impact impactful player. So... Um, and he is those couple of years older, but look, being sort of newer to an AFL program, got, not really, he's coming from Northern Territory, so he hasn't really had those, I guess, traditional junior talent pathways. So I think there's really quite substantial up, untapped potential there. So he could be your, whether it's a Lewis Jetta equivalent or something like that. So if you're really after that outside excitement, Fedjo Jr. is a good bet. And you could get him mid to late, I'd say, with quite a bit of confidence. I don't think he'll go early, but um, yeah, I think he's really that good bet. Where if you miss out on someone like a Nasaya Wanganin Malira, if you had your eye on him early, you could easily get a Fedjo Jr. later. And you're getting someone who's every bit as exciting, if not even possibly a little more exciting in some respects. But yeah, you are getting someone a couple of years older, so be mindful of that. But again, what I've found when I've analyzed mature ages, a lot of the time, even though they are those few years older, they often 
continue to improve at the same or often even better rates than those that are quite a bit younger. So, um, and I think this is really a missed opportunity that a lot of the, I guess you could say online publications aren't really sort of talking about enough and not giving a lot of these mature ages enough credit where they're not realizing that even though they are those couple of years older, you're really not losing anything by taking them because they're still going to keep improving. They're still going to have long careers. So um, yeah, I think really a lot of people really need to rethink, I guess, they're waiting towards mature ages because if you don't have any mature ages in your top 40, well, that's just rec not recognizing really a very important part of the talent pool where if you look at any draft past, you're going to have certainly top 30 players. And from my research, I've found every draft has been at least a top 15 player. So um, yeah, it's just really, it should be obvious, but it just comes back to really researching drafts past. And that's why I've really made that one of my big changes for this year as well where I really wanted to highlight the value of mature ages and really rate them more appropriately. And I think there's even scope for me to possibly bump up a few more mature ages in the future. But um, I, I do believe there is still quite a lot of value in mature ages. So even though we've introduced the preseason supplemental period, even though we've introduced the mid-season draft and we're getting more mature ages taken there, I still see a lot of scope in terms of the mature ages just because there's so many that get overlooked every year a lot of the time and others where they're just not necessarily the preferred, I guess, candidates. And there's such an evenness and such an overall strength where sometimes it's just finding that role player and other times you can find those genuine best 22 any team sort of types. So, um, yeah, I think there's still that untapped scope with mature ages. And with the re reduction in list sizes as well, I think that really broadly speaking almost means there's more players available who should be on AFL lists that aren't compared to a few years ago as well. So, um, yeah, I do think there's those opportunities with that, as well as possibly because of that re list reduction in size. We're also seeing some worthwhile delisted free agents, which we saw both last year, but then again this year. So I think that really sort of, I guess, ups that scope as well. So, um, yeah, that's something else to, I guess, be mindful of. And that's why I've really gone stronger this year as well on some of the delisted free agents. And I've made a video on that as well. So number 40, so Tyson Stengel. So already signed by Geelong, that's fantastic. And look, he's one of those where there wouldn't be very many clubs I'd be willing to sign him for at all. But if you're a Geelong where you've got that established program, you've got your veteran leaders, you've got a strong squad, I think if you've got that really winning team, winning culture, a Stengel can work. So what he was doing in the Sandfall at league level, phenomenal, really good small forward. He's got that really strength through his body and he's got those goal kicking capabilities. So um, just stands up through tackles, even though he's tiny. He's got the ground level craft. He's just a really good footballer. So the key is just really keeping him in check off field, keeping him focused, keeping him doing the right things. So, but he's certainly an AFL level talent based on particularly what he was doing this year in the Sandful. Really impressive season. So credit to him. But yeah, we'll need to stay focused. But look, with Eddie Betts jumping aboard for Geelong, I think that's a good situation for him. So I think he'll have a successful season this year. So moving down to the next tier. So we've got Blake Howes. So you've got a 190 plus centimeter who can be that sort of marking forward. He can be that sort of tall running wing. He could even be better off in defense where he can use that marking weapon, be a bit of a rebounder there as well. So you've got a few options there. For me, it's a bit of uncertainty around his best position. If the season had gone on a bit longer, maybe I'd have him a little bit higher. And with a house, I actually think he's going first round. So um, he is one where maybe I'm underrating him. I'll just have to see in hindsight ultimately. But look, my level of conviction just isn't as high. So I couldn't give him the credit that I was with the guys in the category above. So all these guys have chances to have AFL careers, but they're guys where I'm a bit on the fence, where maybe they make it, but I'm just not as confident as the guys in the tier above. So Rep Bazo, so he's that almost key defender, where is key defense height, where is that 195 or so, but he's still pretty skinny. So, um, but when he's at his best, he's going for his intercept marks with confidence. That's when I really love how he plays. Don't like him as a forward. I don't think he's going to make it as a forward if he gets put there. But in defense, I think there's real scope for him just as that real high level interceptor. So, and look, able enough one-on-one, -on -one, he can rebound a little bit as well. So he's got a good game and I think, really second round onwards he'll come into the mix and be one where he's certainly worth drafting. So Tyler Sonzi. So he's one where coming into the season he was regarded as a top 
five probably for a lot of people, certainly top 10 pick for most people, it's fair to say. Um, and he's had some big games as well, where what he did for Box Hill in the VFL um, really looked good at that level. But then what he was doing back in the NAB League, he had some quiet games where he was just invisible, where he'd be the only named player playing and he just wouldn't have any impact at all. So, um, yeah, look, based on that inconsistency, even though he can still find it, win it, has great skills and he's pretty quick as well, I just really need to see that performance from him, which I just wasn't seeing. And again, with that earlier year birthday, with that expectation coming in based on what he's done at younger age levels, well, he really hasn't shown that rate of improvement that I want. So um, I'd really like to favor those that really show that rate of improvement. And look, Sonsi's had his injuries, had his niggles. So that comes into it as well. That's why he's still on this draft board and he's got the talent. But yeah, look, I just don't, again, have that level of conviction I do with others. Hence, he's in this 40-plus range for me. But again, he's going earlier than this on draft day. He could be your 15 to 30, roughly, pick, just for those that want a bit of a quick draft range there. Um, Sam Butler. So, um, of course, his brother Dan, successful career. looking re- He looked really good, not so much last year, but the year before with the Saints, he looked terrific. So... Um, and with a Sam, he's got a bit more midfield craft. He can go through there, win it a bit more, but brings the pressure, has the energy, has a lot of the same attributes, really quick, um, has a bit of creativity to him. So, um, yeah, he can be that sort of forward, mid, mid forward, whatever mix you want really with him, and he'll sort of bring that energy. So um, certainly draftable, maybe lacks a little bit of polish as with Dan, but he's certainly more advanced than Dan was at the same age. So, um, yeah, sort of your probably he's a second rounder could slip in late first round but I think he'll go probably second round so um, probably goes higher than where I've got him again and the same will be the case with a lot of these guys just because I've bumped up a few mature ages higher than a lot of them are likely to feature on draft day if indeed some of them feature at all so um, so Jesse Motlop so um, son of Daniel um, not father son eligible because Daniel didn't play enough game he didn't play 100 games for any one team but um, yeah, eligible as a Frio Next Gen Academy. So um, Fremantle, of course, they'd be hoping that there's no bid inside the top 40 if they want him, but um, it, there's going to be a club that'll take him inside the top 40. So unfortunately, as a metro region Indigenous talent in WA, he's not eligible. Or rather, he Fremantle would have no way of matching, ultimately, because a bid would need to be outside the top 40 for him. So... Um, yeah, look, Fremantle could consider him with their pick 19, potentially. Um, whether they will or not depends on who else is available. That could be an option. But yeah, as, it, as with Daniel, look, he's a talented small forward, brings it defensively. Defensively is how he really impacts games, so he's one that really brings it on that side. But look, he can hit the scoreboard, good at ground level, as you'd expect, being a Motlop, so true to his name. So yeah, look, he's a talent. Could he be in that sort of Daniel Rioli where it's maybe not quite enough scoreboard impact? That's sort of where I'm feeling, but he obviously brings it sort of in terms of that. He has that speed, agility, brings in terms of that pressure. So, look, he could make it, but we'll just have to sort of see whether he can step his game up beyond being at that level. So, bit of a uh, again, I'm a bit on the fence there where maybe he makes it, maybe he doesn't. So, as with all these guys in this range here, but certainly has some AFL scope, hence he's inside my top 50. So Darcy Wilmot, so um, yeah, obviously the December birthday, so a great deal of scope to improve. Would have been good to see more of the continuation of this year, but look, he's pretty sound offensively. He can intercept, can rebound, so um, you could easily make a case he should be higher than this, but probably for me lacked a little bit of polish in quite a bit of what he was doing. So um, look, I do have him a bit lower than I guess those um, rebounding sort of defenders that I had in the 20s. Um, but look, he could prove to be in their category. So we'll just have to wait and see there. But one of those where I'd say he's potentially developable, but not a certainty. So he just needs to keep improving to get to that standard where I'd say he's an AFL talent. Because at this point, based on what I've seen, he's not there yet, but maybe he can in the future. Judson Clark, you've got an exciting small forward who can hit the scoreboard, has the ground level craft, all that. But I'm almost more intrigued by what he could do as sort of a rebounding guy off half back ultimately, where he's got a great deal of speed, he can take on the game, but then he's also got the skills as well. So um, that's what almost excites me a little bit more with the Judson Clark, but he will need to develop that contested side a bit more to his game and 
Um, we'll see how he develops one-on-one -on -one as well to see if he could possibly be that sort of defender. But yeah, look, the creativity sort of in the front half as well also gives an option there too. So um, yeah, we'll have to see how that develops. And then we've got a Tom Brown. So he's another where he's in that Wilmot category where again, talented rebounding defender can generate drive ultimately from defense. Um, yeah, so again, bit on the fence. Will he make it? Won't he? Have to see. But as with a Wilmot, um, I, I think he does go earlier than this. So a Wilmot, he could be a first rounder. Um, if he's not, then he's going probably early second, I'd say. And with a Brown, I'd be saying he could be in that similar range where he could sneak in late first round. Otherwise, he's a second rounder. So um, yeah, again, I'd probably have him later than clubs will, but that's all right. It's just, again, I've got a lot of mature ages higher, which is why a lot of these guys in this range have had to ultimately move down. Morgan Ferris, so what he did in his two Sandful under-18 games, really good. He kicked, I think it was seven and six goals. So as that sort of 191, 192-ish um, leading forward, but really strong one-on-one, -on -one, takes contested marks. He can push up the field as well. So he's got some options there. Wasn't as good at reserves level where he didn't dominate. He probably kicked a goal a game roughly. So... Um, but look, he does have some tools where maybe it could be something like maybe a Tim Membry as an example. So um, possibly not as advanced for the same age. Um, and again, I would have liked more from him at reserves level to really be a bit more sold on him. But yeah, I, I feel sort of top 50 confident at least in him where he can be that sort of strong marking third tall roughly who can really be a threat in the front half. So I think there are opportunities with him to possibly become someone. So Jake Saligo, so Eastern Rangers, is really an energetic midfielder I'd describe him as. So has a lot of speed, he can win his own footy. He, he does some good things, but he is that sort of smaller midfielder who's sort of that buzzy type. So he can have an influence and he could be a potential piece. Um, Lachlan Patton, so I really liked what he did actually in his final game during the under-19 champs, and that's really what fit him into this top 55 category. Um, but he's one of those where he can play really across half forward, brings the energy, really has that pressure as that real foundation of his game. But he can win a bit of the ball. Skills, look, I've found him quite neat in some of the games I've seen, but other games he can lack a bit of consistency. But he does, other than, I guess, the foot skills side of the game, he really does most things very well, and he can really impact games. So I thought he was really, in that final under-19 uh, under champs game, probably... WA's best. So really influential, but he can push up through the midfield. You could even put him across half back, have him sort of provide a bit of a rebound. He's almost, to give you a name, almost the equivalent of a Jack Sinclair in this draft. So if he develops well, maybe he could become something along those lines as that pretty well-rounded type who does everything really well, can really run and carry, brings the pressure, does most things pretty well. So um, yeah, Patton's one I'm quite intrigued by, and I see some value sort of mid to late in. So, um, Lachlan Rankin, one of the most talented small forwards for me, where he's just really exciting. He's got the speed, he's got the agility, great at ground level, can finish around goal, good skills. So there's a lot there. Um, still skinny, can develop as that contested ball winner, probably not that midfielder, but he's got a lot of talent there. So... Um, yeah, one of the more interesting Victorians. And had the season gone on, look, maybe he'd be a little bit higher than this. But look, based on the shortened season, a lot of the Victorians I couldn't give too, too much credit for, ultimately. Or two, rather. Um, Corey Preston. So, overager. And I've really liked, actually, what he's done in defence. I think he really found a home there later on in the Victorian campaign. So... Um, just as that interceptor generates drive by foot, really good by foot. So, um, again, you've got those options with him. He's pretty strong one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah, I don't love him through the midfield forward, probably not quite talented enough. Midfielder, he'd need to be more of a contested ball winner. But in defense, I think he's found a home. So I'd pretty happily draft him in that latter part as a rookie of the draft just because he's really got that game where if you're looking for a general defender, I think a Preston could be a pretty good value get ultimately. So I've got Biggie Nguyen. So for me, premature delisting from Richmond. Um, and it's just really, he didn't get that opportunity to develop. That's the problem where last year, of course, there was no VFL season this year, shortened VFL season. And with Biggie, look, he's a project player. So he really needs that time. 
He was actually a little more advanced than Alir Alir at the same age and stage, where he was that better ball reader, better mark. Um, but obviously he's still skinny. He just needs time. So um, I'd happily give him another chance. If I'm looking for a project key defender later in the draft as a rookie, I think he'll get through to the rookie draft anyway. But I'd be really comfortable taking Biggie. So um, really like his talent. I would have rated him in his draft year nearing that 20 mark, I'd say. I'd have to recheck my order. So, um, yeah, I certainly liked him at the time of that draft. And, look, it's just he needs more time. So um, I'd be more than happy to give that to him. And the last player in this category, so Marty Gleason. So delisted by Essendon, they just couldn't get him games in defence. And he has had his injuries, which has been a shame. But still, fundamentally, I like his game where... He can still win his one-on-ones. He intercepts and reads it very well in defense, and he can use the footy. So, um, yeah, look, I like his game. I think he's a genuine fit in a back six for a team. So it's just a case of if you need a ready-to-go general defender and you don't mind their age, even if they're in that sort of mid to late 20s region, well, I think Gleason's a good get for a team. So um, that's why I've given him the credit and put him on my draft board ultimately. And to move on to the next group. So... Starting with Bailey Lambert. So he started off the VFL season like a man possessed. So in his first three games, I believe it was 11 goals he kicked. So, And he's one of those real X-factor goal-kicking forwards. So still in his early to mid-20s, so it's not like he's over-the-hill old. He's still got a long career ahead of him if he's drafted. So, And of course, Richmond didn't nominate him as a father-son. They could have. Son of Craig, he was eligible, played enough games. So, um, But yeah, ultimately, Richmond chose not to pick him up. So... Um, I think there is value represented potentially in the latter part of the draft or as a rookie if you want that real genuine goal-kicking forward. So, um, yes, yeah, certainly Lambert is one where I'd say there's a bit of value there, ultimately. And I'd say the same as well for Jacob Dawson. So, um, what he was doing in the VFL, he was playing really good footy. So, finding a heap of it, he'd have his 40 disposal games, win a heap of it contested, but he was having an influence on games. So... Um, and look, again, he's a young guy. He's in his, he'd be in his early to mid-20s, so um, former Gold Coast, um, and they weren't really sort of giving him those opportunities. So I think they were even playing him in defense, if I recall correctly, in sort of the latter part of his time there. So, um, But yeah, really good midfielder. That's If you're drafting him, draft him as a midfielder because that's where he plays his best footy easily. Tyler Keitel. So he's been really good in the waffle for quite a while now and he's one of those guys where look it's he's not young but he's a ready to go plug and play key forward so um just really kicks a heap of goals strong mark is a presence up forward so um and really with key forwards you just want those goal kicking threats so and with a Kaitel, just ready to go plug and play put him in if you're say a brisbane where you're missing a hip wood for the season Plug in a Kaitel, pick him up with your last rookie pick. There's probably no one interested in him. So that's the sort of pick I'd be making, certainly, there. Um, And then we've got Hamelman. So similar story. So former Brisbane, funnily enough, as it works out. But that tall key forward, great on the lead. He's that sort of, he's a real marking presence. But he hits the scoreboard like mad, makes the most of his opportunities. Again, if you're missing a Hipwood, you can easily just plug in a Hamelman as a short-term rental just about as a rookie. So... Um, yeah, I think there's real value again with a Hamelman. So, um, and then a Jack Hayes. So we're going from the Waffle to the VFL to the Sandful now. But um, Jack Hayes, so he's not quite that key forward height. But again, you've got an athletic marking presence. He could be that Josh Corbett equivalent, I guess you could say. Um, where, again, he can play as a competitor. He's played some really good footy for a long time now in the Sandful. So again, if you want that immediate option as that key forward get a jack hayes and look you could put him in defense if you wanted to and he could be fine as that sort of intercept marking type given his athletic profile and how strong of a mark he is so you've got a lot of options there but these guys fundamentally can all play footy so sam lowson so very talented forward so if you're looking for a speedy goal kicking forward lowson's a good get he's been overlooked for a number of years now but look he can play so Um, Yeah, again, I'd be very comfortable picking him with, and really you just pick him as a rookie because, again, there's no one, as far as I'm aware, that's even looking at him. So um, good talent. If you need that speed and scoreboard impact, go get a loosen. He's good. 
Tyrone Thorne. So he's a younger type who's been playing really good footy in the waffle. So, um, and look, he's not tall. He's probably that one, I don't know, 170 odd thereabouts, but he's one of those where he's got the skills. He finds a heap of it. He can win his own ball, but great at ground level. So you could play him as a forward, whereas a pressure forward, he can hit the scoreboard, play, make, find the targets inside 50. But then he can also play through the midfield, find a heap of it. Just that speed agility combo that he's got, elite. And then he's got the skills as well on top of that. So, um, yeah, really talented player who, for me, should be given up opportunity at AFL level. But again, not aware of any interest. So, um, which is a shame because, again, I'd pretty happily rookie him. And he's going to do better than quite a lot of players that will be drafted this year, I'd imagine. So, um, yeah, again, rate him. Noah Pagorio. So or Pagaro. Um, he's played really well as a key defender. He's developing well. So it'd be about a 24-year-old thereabouts, but he's that athletic key defender, only around a 194 thereabouts, but high leaper, can generate a bit of drive from defense, whether it's with run, by foot, but yeah, he intercepts quite well. So he's got some capabilities. He's able enough as a shutdown player, but um, yeah, just one of those who came into the waffle a little bit later, didn't really come through the junior development pathways but yeah just a really good talent who i guess has afl potential potentially so um yeah maybe in the latter part of the draft maybe as a rookie he could be considered after being sort of considered in previous years so um there still does seem to be that genuine afl interest there so we'll have to see how that goes but again there's one where possibly he could lock down an afl role so um one to consider at least as depth um, Hugh Jackson, I really liked what he was doing in the first half of the season as a midfielder, where he was getting in the Sandful under 18s Tom Powell numbers. And with that as well, he showed a lot of class and really good skills as well. So you've got those components. Um, but yes, yeah, second half of the year, he just really dropped off a cliff. So um, yeah, just wasn't really impacting games in the same way. So he really, it feels like, needs to be really a high usage play through him as much as possible type to be effective so um yeah it's a shame he could possibly develop some forward craft he's got the instincts at ground level and again the skills where he could be maybe a playmaker across half forward but again just haven't seen enough impact from him but <clears throat> that yeah potentially he could be a piece for a team to consider maybe late maybe as a rookie i wouldn't be picking him in the first half of the draft but one for consideration where i think certainly based on what i was seeing in the first half of the year I want to at least give him the acknowledgement of having him on my extended board and as someone where I'd, again, advocate that he gets picked later on. Cooper Murley, um, really talented. He can play mid forward, has speed, has skill. Not a big body though, um, but he can do damage. So rate him. Um, and again, he could be one where maybe probably third round, could be second round, he could be considered, but that's sort of what you're looking at. Um, Cooper Beacon, about a 191-ish defender, really good interceptor and good skills. So um, there's some capabilities there where maybe he could be a piece coming off half-back. Max Pescard, overager, overlooked last year by Gold Coast. Again, they're not interested in him this year either, um, but really talented forward. So watching what he was doing, particularly not in 2021, but in 2020, he was a really dynamic forward doing good stuff. And then seeing him in the, in the VFL this year as well. Um, whether he's pushing up the field, he can really find the footy now, which is impressive. And again, if you have him forward of center, he's doing damage. He's hitting the scoreboard. So good athlete, good overhead, hits the scoreboard, can even play make a little bit. So um, yeah, you've got a lot of options there with the pest guard. And he's one where he's still skinny, so he'll still develop. So um, yeah, I'm still quite interested in him as a prospect ultimately. Um, Max Lister, um, yeah, another really good interceptor across half back. So overager, overlooked last year, but yeah, seeing what he was doing during the under nineteen champs, he was good across half back. So, um, just one of those really solid pieces in defence where he just brings that intercepting side. So again, like him, good athlete, moves well. He's one where I'd consider drafting probably again as a rookie. I, I think all these guys really, I'd be more looking at more as rookies. So whether it's the likes of a Beacon, hopefully Pescard, Litster, and same with Josh Clark, who's the next one. So another overager. Um, I really like the drive he generates across halfback. So Victorian um, has the speed, can use it by foot, very skinny, can't win his own ball. Um, but again, as that rebounder, look, if he gets a bit stronger, can compete one-on-one, -on -one, intercept a little bit. I think there's scope across there that he could 
potentially be a piece. So again, one where I'd be pretty comfortable rookieing him. Um, Jay Lohman, I think he's probably probably more third round thereabouts for me, but he's got some weapons. He can take on the game, really generate some drive. Um, just a good athlete. So I, I personally like him more across half back, sort of to generate drive. But look, he can play sort of further field. He can go forward. You can play him sort of on a wing. You've got some options there, but good athletic profile. Um, James Willis, he's got some weapons, really has acceleration and a good kick to him. So um, given he's got those tools, maybe he develops, maybe needs a bit more polish ultimately. Um, still probably on the skinny side, could win a bit more sort of contested, but he's finding a heap of the ball. So um, he's one where he's got some weapons and maybe he could be developable. So in the latter part, maybe as a rookie, he could be considered. Um, Jack Williams, he's been handy as a key forward in the um, Waffle Colts. And also when he attends ruck contests inside 50, he's a bit like a Tom Hawkins where he can bully guys, push off them, win the ball out of the ruck, hit, hit the scoreboard. So you've got that optionality with him as well. But I probably prefer him more as a key defender where I'd be looking, use that leap of his, is it able enough mark, is strong, can win his one-on-ones. So um, probably as a key defender would be more where I'd be looking at. He'll go a lot earlier than this on draft day. Uh, he'll be most likely, I'd say probably a second round and maybe third at a push, but... Um, yeah, I'm pretty confident he'll get drafted anyway. So he's got a, I think he's got a December birthday top of mind. So um, yeah, again, good talent, but probably one just because I haven't really loved what he's done as a key forward, probably doesn't quite have enough dimensions to his game to really be able to take advantage of too many key defenders. I think that probably limits him, but I'm speculating that he could really transition into a pretty decent key defender. So that's why I've given him consideration to have him later on my board. Um, Joshua Brown um, really liked what he was doing in the Waffle Colts as a midfielder, but ultimately when he got to the under-19 champs, he just looked lost because he wasn't really getting those on-ball opportunities. So it's one of those pure midfielders where he just has to play through there to be influential. So a good ball winner, tackles, finds a heap of it, can even hit the scoreboard a little bit here and there. But um, yeah, ultimately just in the end dropped down my draft board. But yeah, perhaps during the under-19 champs, had he been really given those more prominent midfield opportunities, I'd probably have him quite a bit higher on my draft board because there was a while there watching what he was doing in the Waffle Colts. I really liked him. So, um, but yeah, unfortunately, I've had to really drop him away just because really what I was seeing during the under-19 champs, look, he was pretty well invisible. So um, yeah, just needed a bit more from that, maybe a bit more versatility ultimately and a few more ways to impact games as well. Um, Jared Pollock, so we're into the recycled territory here, but I still believe in him as a talent. So it's just a case of a team finding a role for him. He's just a short-term piece. He's getting on in years. He'd be turning 30 next year, I'm sure. So, or if not, it'll be the year after. But um, yeah, just as that outside mid, I think he's still got the scope as that meters gain type. He's got the run, he's got the use by foot, moves still really well. So um, uh, for me, has been a bit underutilized by North Melbourne. And I think on a team where maybe it's a team that's competitive for finals, looking to win, you could just rookie a Pollock or maybe take him late if you really wanted to make sure you get him. So um, yeah, still one I'd be pretty comfortable with. And then the last name on this list. So we've got Levi Casbolt. So um, we'll have to see what decision he makes in terms of whether he wants to continue his career and take the steps necessary to continue his career. Um, but if he indeed does, well, he'd be someone where I'd be very comfortable taking him. So whether it's as that key forward ruck, that's the possibility. And again, maybe it's a Brisbane type situation where you use him in that role. You could even do the same at a Gold Coast potentially where he could be that key forward ruck. But I also like the scope potentially to put him behind the ball as a key defender where obviously strong, athletic enough where he can be fine. But is that strong contested Mark ultimately who reads it really well? So um I really think there was an opportunity missed during his career not where he should have been really used as a key defender. Um, but unfortunately, that hasn't occurred. But I think a team could potentially, if they're looking for that ready-to-go instant key defender for a few years, I think there's scope to maybe get a few more years out of him than people would be possibly thinking. So, um, so he was born in 1990, so obviously he's getting on in years. But with key position players, you can play him to whether it's 33, 34, 35, sometimes depending on how their body's holding up. So um, as a short-term play, I think a Casbolt would be possibly suitable as well. And I also wanted to acknowledge some of the best players not to nominate for the draft. So firstly, Connor McKenna. So 
he's still an island, but he did sort of on Twitter, I guess, tease us that maybe he'd consider coming back. So he hasn't nominated for the draft, did retire, so he's not really eligible to join anything, sadly. But he's one where, look, had he nominated, I think he's really a top 25 player, ultimately, where I just loved what he was doing before he went to Ireland as that real real sort of damaging rebounding defender where both in terms of the run, what he was doing by foot, really impa- impactful. So um, really like his game, ultimately. And then we've got a Will Pierce. So he's the only junior out of really the under-18 ranks where he would fit in my top 75 power rankings, but he didn't nominate for the draft. Maybe it was just no interest from AFL clubs. That's probably, I'd imagine it. I don't know the background behind that, but um, he was the Sandful under-18 leading goal kicker and really strong body, really damaging player, just really impactful in all the games I've seen. So um, really surprising to me that he didn't at least nominate, but if he continues with his footy, I think he could be a potential piece and I I think there's still scope to develop. So he's one of those bigger bodies where he does need to probably improve his endurance, improve his mobility and all that a little bit more. But um, just with that strength and power that he's got and just how dangerous he is, particularly forward of centre, and he can even go through the midfield, win it as well. Um, He would be one where I would have had him either just inside or just outside of my top 50. So, um, yeah, it's one of those unfortunate cases where he just hasn't nominated. So, um, Tom Lynch, so obviously delisted by Adelaide, but... Um, again, if he were to nominate, I would certainly be recruiting him in a hurry. I think he was still playing good footy last year and he has been really good for a number of years. So, um, yeah, I think possibly is that sort of one to three year rental, possibly maybe you could have got a bit more out of him. And I I would have really encouraged North Melbourne to say, Hey, play for us for a year or two at AFL levels and AFL listed player aside from just being sort of a development coach or whatever he is with North Melbourne now. So. Um, yeah, I thought there was still that sort of scope there potentially, but yeah, it doesn't sound like it'll be going that way given he hasn't nominated, but, um, yeah, Hayden Sloyth. So I bring up his name every year, but he's one of those really good waffle league level players where whether it's as a midfielder, whether it's as a forward, he's AFL caliber. So, um, it's just sad that he's not getting that next opportunity because he was a former Fremantle listed player, but, um. Yeah, it's just a shame because, again, he's been just incredible at Waffle League level. And the year that Tim Kelly was drafted, well, Sleuth was on the same team and he was the better footballer that year. So just to give you a point of comparison where we're not talking about some guy where, look, maybe is a marginal talent who could be AFL caliber. We're talking about someone who was outperforming someone who was instantly AFL caliber. So, um, yeah. And then you've got a Jai Bolton where he's in that same category as a Sloith, but as a midfielder, what he was doing through the midfield, phenomenal. And as a big game player, he's he's got it. So um, it was a shame that Collingwood didn't retain him longer than they did because from what I was seeing in the preseason when he was with Collingwood, he was showing some signs and I was really surprised by how good he was so quickly. But um, he obviously cut very quickly and what he's been doing for the Waffle for a number of years now, as with Sloith, just... AFL caliber play is out performing the guys who, whether it's for the, whether it's with basically the West Coast reserves, whether it's for Peel with the Fremantle reserves, look, he, they're both outplaying them. So we're really looking at good quality AFL players. But of course, being now in their late 20s, well, it's just not going to happen. That's why they didn't nominate. There doesn't seem to be that genuine AFL interest. But yeah, gee, I rate them as genuine AFL talents. They would be on this draft board as in my top twenty, uh, in my top seventy-five, I should say. So, um, yeah, it's just again those missed opportunities and not, I guess, recognizing how good some of these state leaguers are. And I'd be saying the same of Josh Newman, so um, brother of Nick Newman. So he had a really good season. You can play him across half back, but he was getting midfield opportunities and really playing a high impact per possession brand through the midfield. So. Um, yeah, again, he could potentially be a piece for a club had he been picked. But um, yeah, being in that sort of, I guess, mid to late 20s range, look, there just isn't that genuine interest at this age and stage. But again, for me, Newman is one of those where he could be AFL caliber and he could slot into a team. So um, yeah, again, opportunity missed, sadly. Thanks for watching, guys. And if you enjoy this video, make sure you check out the rest of my content on espn.com.au slash AFL.
So if you want a bit more in depth, I guess, look at my um, top 20 power rankings. I've really gone through that and gone through strengths, weaknesses, where guys are likely to be picked, some sort of player comparisons or who they're sort of similar to stylistically. So, um, and you'll also over the coming week, of course, be getting my full phantom draft. So that's something to look forward to. And also some draft reviews, both after the first round is complete and after the rest of the draft is complete. So um, yeah, ESPN.com.au is where you can find my content. So make sure you watch out over the coming days for that. But um, yeah, if you haven't already, subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already for my channel. Um, I'll continue producing YouTube content over the coming years. So um, yeah, do stay tuned in. And I'll consider if there's demand completing some more maybe over the um, over the break potentially, so over the off season. So um, yeah, let me know if you have any particular special requests and I'll give them some due consideration as well. But anyway, guys, see you in the next video.